Is Mr. Magic Johnson your friend versus Mr. Larry Bird simply the best player rivalry of all time? I think so. You know you caused me a lot of sleepless nights. <laughs> you are the most feared player. I feared you more than anybody else because this man would find a way to win that damn game. <laughs> Ain't nobody ever gave me shit I had to get my own chance to make it out the field Slim as a chicken bone These lames don't want us to shine I hear it in their tone All I really want to do is rhyme I be in my zone Yo, this new era I do not feel it I know you think my shit hot But do not steal it I be spitting out grease like a hot skillet Anything you hear me on You know that I'ma kill it These new niggas It's so ass don't come around my way, you get no pass. I don't even know what's going on these days. You ain't understand? Well, let me rephrase. Ain't nobody gave me shit. Just mama, not Reagan, not Clinton, not the Bushes, Obama. Magic's just a great basketball player. He's the best I've ever seen, you know. I, unbelievable. I don't know what to say. And, and those two guys were just totally different players from totally different spectrums of the world, basically, you know, and, and they just had a different style. And I broke the switch. It never changed so off the straight wall. And I broke the switch. The drama don't stop. It stays on. And I broke the switch. But let it change so off the straight wall. And I broke the switch. The drama don't stop. It stays on. And that's the only guy in the shot. Wrap around the bird for Magic Score. Magic's got Kiki to the left, Bird to the right. He gives the bird back to Magic. I saw Larry Bird was actually in a magazine. Saw his stats. Blown away by his stats. But let's see if he can really do it against us. But in his senior year, Bird began to convince the doubters. He would single-handedly lead the unknown Sycamores to the NCAA Finals. It's destiny for these guys. Once people saw him play, there were no doubts. We were watching Indiana State games here in Boston. Local TV made sure that they got their games because the Celtics were so bad. And he began to embody and represent hope. We came down a couple times. I go behind my back, no look to him. He no look back to me. And I'm laying it up. I'm saying, oh, man. Here's that last play. Magic Johnson going in, drops off the bird. Bird puts it back off inside to Johnson. Super bad. This guy got game. Aren't you going to get the stretching? I don't stretch. Stretching's for show-offs. My ball plan does the talking for me, so. <laughs> you know, when I was in college one time, I was watching a game on TV. They had this home box office thing. And I turned on the, this game. They were playing against Russia. And I was watching Magic play, and I go, oh, my God, that's the best player I've ever seen play because I didn't follow basketball. And he was a sophomore at the time. <laughs> I remember telling a friend of mine, I said, they're going to win the NCAA championship this year. But well, we go all the way through undefeated, and there's magic standing there. It's just like it was made to happen. On the night of March 26, 1979, it was the NCAA championship, Indiana State versus Michigan State, a game that still ranks as the highest-rated college final ever on television, a game that's now remembered as a prologue to a rivalry that transformed a sport and intertwine two legacies. But on that night, March 26, 1979, the first time Magic Johnson and Larry Bird ever went head to head on a basketball court, they were simply two young men trying to win a very big ball game. Well, this is probably the biggest game I'll ever play in my life, and I just feel like 
you know, I'm representing not only myself, my team, but we're representing our school and our, and our town, Terre Haute. Well, it's uh, a dream come true, really, for me. Uh, I won the state title back in my home state, and then my next accomplishment was going to the NCAA and playing in uh, a game like tonight in the finals. They were two stars thrown together by the cosmos to compete. Everything was written with uh, Bird versus Magic, Magic versus Bird, that whole thing. And, 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 and it wasn't Indiana State versus Michigan State anymore. It was, it was Larry Bird versus Magic Johnson. Larry Bird had become, alongside Magic Johnson, the talk of college basketball. I couldn't wait to call home to tell my boys, man, this dude named Larry Bird is for real. This is the baddest white dude I've ever seen in my life. Ain't no question about that. Larry Bird's Sycamores of Indiana State savored their unbeaten season. We were totally shocked. I mean, we'd watched them all year long coming along, and we kind of thought, you know, well, as soon as they get to the tournament, then we'll find out the real thing. And then somehow they just kept winning. Michigan State wasn't a drop kick then either. I mean, back then it was believed that Magic was great, but oh, he couldn't shoot. And so it, it wasn't a foregone conclusion that we'd see Magic and, and Larry in the final. And then the unlikely occurred. Magic and Bird would meet for the national title. Their differences were striking. When Larry Bird played against Magic Johnson uh, in the 1979 NCAA Finals, you would have thought that there couldn't be two people less alike in the world. I did not like Larry Bird, he didn't like me because we were both going after the same thing. I wanted to be the best and he wanted to be the best. So it's like, two old gunslingers saying, meet me out front. And you know, only one could survive. All of a sudden, you had a, a college basketball game that felt like a heavyweight championship fight. This thing picked up momentum, it picked up momentum. And, and here you had this jazzy kid from East Lansing and, and, and the hick from French Lake. And, and one kid with a team of four players that you knew wouldn't be able to get a pickup game as soon as the tournament was over. And then this, this team that, that had to be flashy because they had to keep up with Magic. It was Allie Frazier. It's, it's, it's all it was. As it turned out, they, they were Ebony and Ivory twins. They were, they were the same guy. They were small town guys who grew up on the, their local hard courts where they could spend five hours, seven hours a day just playing basketball. And the only thing they cared about was winning the game. We're mirrors of each other. Uh, I may smile a little bit more, but... <laughs> the way we played the game of basketball was exactly the same because we would do anything to win. We didn't care about scoring points. We cared about winning the game and making our teammates better. I think Magic wanted to be friends with Larry Bird. He wanted to be friends with him on the World Invitational Tournament, and Larry just wasn't very receptive. I think he wanted to be friends with him during the Final Four. Larry wouldn't even go over and shake his hand. So now Magic's saying, well, what's with this guy? Everybody loves me. How come you don't love me? Just a year after sharing the court on Team USA, they were back together. And the day before the big game, Magic couldn't wait to greet his old playmate. And then State was on practicing, and we were waiting in the tunnel. We got there early. I wanted to definitely say hello to Larry, you know. When they came through, it was like nobody was saying nothing. I wanted to go toward them, like his guys, like made sure that he didn't say nothing. And then they kind of start snickering, like, Michigan State, you in trouble. We're going to kill you guys tomorrow. That just said it's on now. It is Indiana State against Michigan State. I'm Bryant Dumbo, and the fans here are going bananas. I mean, let's face it, if, if Larry Bird were black and, and came from Chicago, it wouldn't have been as big a deal. They, they, were, they were polar opposites. One black, one white, one outgoing, one shy. That was the charm of the attraction. The bird against magic. All of the superlatives have been used, and believe me, all of them have been warranted. Heading into the tournament, magic was the bigger star. But by tip-off, it was bird. Having hardly missed a shot in the semifinal, who had become the focus of fans, and more importantly, of Michigan State. We actually had two men on Larry everywhere he went. I'm surprised they didn't play a box on one, you know, four guys on Larry and one on the other four. Um, because that's, they didn't have a lot of talent. You know, if you stop Larry, you pretty much stop them. Look at the pressure around him. Two, three, men, and he's short. I didn't play well at all. Biggest game of my life, I didn't play well. Bird, way short. 
I think our, our length and our size, our jumping ability was able to bother him. Bird hanging, can't score. I didn't shoot well, missed, uh, I think, three free throws. Larry Bird has had a cold shooting night. I battled him, but I didn't have it. I thought you did a great job on Larry Bird in the zone denying him the ball. Yes, uh, Coach uh, gave us a good game plan to go against Larry Bird, and all we had to do was go out and do it. That's what we've done. And congratulations, Super Bowl game. It was over, you know. That was my four years. I was done. No, it still hurts. When you win 33 in a row and you walk into a game, you know, you never know what to expect, but I expect to win. We didn't win. Toughest loss I ever took. Magic was just mind-boggling to me, the way he'd get the ball off the board and dribble it up and make the play. It seemed like he had his hand in everything. seminal game, it brought a lot of non-college fans to the game, who then became college basketball fans. I got a chance to turn Michigan State around and make them a basketball power. We ended up winning the national championship. We got beat because they were the best team. They were the best team in college basketball at that time. Uh, in college, when we met for the uh, 1979 NCAA championship, you know, I had a Real dislike for Larry. You know, he's a, a very uh, competitive player, and I'm a very competitive player. And uh, we go head to head, and uh, we go for blood almost. The vibe was, it was nasty. It was ugly. It was, uh, we didn't like each other. Magic, were you inclined early on to b become friends with this guy? Because you, you were drawn to him because of his uh, basketball abilities. Was, was we, Did you want to be friends with him from the beginning? And from the beginning, I wanted to be friends, but Larry didn't want n none of that. <laughs> you know, and so... <laughs> <laughs> you know. They had some wonderful moments on the court, but they probably spoke to each other four, maybe five times during that entire time period, and, and it was more like, hello, how are you this morning, Larry? I'm good, Magic. What'd you have for breakfast? Don't remember. Have a nice day. But such curtness was hardly strange, coming from Larry Bird. I'm the one that did all that, to tell you the truth. It was... I just don't want to be hanging around him. I mean, that was my main competition. I think he was a mystery to the extent that, that, that he wanted to be a mystery. He didn't enjoy doing interviews. He didn't go out of his way to do them. He wasn't particularly good at them. He was kind of like, hey, this is who I am. You want to know who I am? Watch the game. And so I, I said, okay, if that's how it's going to be, then we have to be like that. <laughs> yeah, that's you, know, right. so. you don't like me? Fine. All right, good. I don't like you either. <laughs> I started disliking him too. Then, you know, so, uh, but, you know, he told me that, you know, I smiled all the time, and he knew that uh, I, I will smile at you, but I want to cut your heart out at uh -huh. the same yeah. time. So yeah. he knew that that was part of my strategy right. to get him, lure him in as so, my friend. So he, he didn't want to show, demonstrate any weakness by being, becoming your friend. Now, did you feel what his advances to being a friend, and you just rejected them? You were not interested? You didn't like him? I mean, what was, what was your it's side not, of that? It's not like one more girlfriends, you know I mean? <laughs> Uh, when you say advances, I get a little scared. But, uh, but, uh, I probably did snub him. I don't remember it, but I'm, I'm sure I did. I didn't want any, you know, like I call it love fest, hugging and, and, and slapping high fives with opponent. You're there for a reason. You're there to win a game. You know, my, my thing was when you compete, 
You're really not friends. You, you want to keep an edge. He wanted to be the Wizard of Oz. He wanted to intimidate people and keep them at bay. The further we are away from each other, the more I like it. And I was like that through high school and through college, but Irvin is an outgoing guy. He loves everybody. He wants to high five and, you know, he got that big, <laughs> big smile. My goal was to try to take three of them teeth home with me. <laughs> <laughs> That's two different perspectives. <laughs> That's interesting because uh, in Indiana, uh, uh, Michigan. Uh, Aided by forward Greg Kelser, Magic led the Spartans into the Final Four. At the beginning of the game, did you meet uh, Irvin uh, there? Why? <laughs> <laughs> do you do you remember trying to talk to uh, Larry before the game? Nope. Yeah. I, I, you had I, learned your lesson. I learned my lesson, and uh, at that time. He was going after something I wanted bad, and I was going after something he wanted bad. So we didn't want to talk. What, what, what did that, uh, and it was like a 10-point loss. Am I right, Larry? Well, it, it was 10-point. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it felt more, more like a 20-point loss. But, you know, when you're out there playing and you get started in these games, sometimes you go, uh-oh, these guys are pretty good. Right. And I had that feeling at halftime that yeah. these guys were too much for us. I don't know mentally if I was prepared as I should have been for that game because, um, you know, I didn't have a good game. I shot like seven for 20 from the field and, and uh, you know, and our team relied on me to score. So if I had a week to go back on, probably that week to prepare and, and get ready for that game. What did losing that championship mean to you and how did it affect yeah, that's, you? Yeah, that's the toughest one I've ever taken um, because, you know, you had all your friends, um, you're at a college. It's really when you step away from home, I, I felt um, in uh, Indiana State, they, they accepted me, brought me in. Um, it was tough, and it's still tough. Yeah. But um, still, still tough today. Yes. Yeah. And he couldn't escape the memory of losing to him in 1979. Oh, it ate at him bad that he didn't win that national title against Magic. That was something it just burned him. It was one thing for them to be in the 79 championship. Magic had the better team. Everybody agreed with that. How, how about you, Magic? What did winning that title mean for you? <laughs> well, you know, you just heard him. It's still tough for him. <laughs> I knew it was going to haunt him forever because we were going to see each other a lot. He came to a game, and everybody starts standing up clapping, and I'm thinking, like, what in the hell is going on here? This guy didn't even play the game. They don't even know what he's about, but they just think that, you know, he's going to be the difference. He didn't impress me no more than any other white guy I've ever seen play before. I think that you would say that most black players at the time were racist. And, you know, with my mentality, I thought, well, I'll go in there, and, and you know, I'll just do my best to get better. I'm thinking, oh, he's slow, he can't get off a shot. He's not that strong. This is going to be a layup. Bam. Knocks down the jump shot. Okay. Maybe that was luck. It, it was blowing my mind because he's dominating Jack Givens, player of the year in college basketball. Larry Bird is eating him alive. Gets the ball again. Bam. Knocks down another jump shot. Now I'm thinking like, okay, hey. You know what? I'm gonna D this guy up. I'm gonna show him what it's like. 20 feet away. Bam. 25 feet away. Bam. Well, you know, the league needs great white players. The league needs great black players, you know, because it's great for marketing, great for the league, you know, fans and everything. And so I thought they were really just pushing somebody to, to be a great white player. I didn't think he was as good as everybody saying he was. But once I came and started playing with him, I, I, I realized then that everything they said about him was true. You know, we, we sit back out and have a beer out there in the, in a the locker room, and we was talk, you know, be maybe talking. It's like, you know, white boy just lit you up. And I used to always say that, you know, like to my friends, they'd be like, yo, is Larry really that good? I used to say like, yeah, that's the baddest white boy I ever played against. <laughs> I my mind just goes to that. Damn, this white guy can play. Waiters from the hotel would be over there. They were black, older, and they let me play. You know, I always looked at that as I got an opportunity to play against a black man, and they treated me good. I couldn't wait to play against the best, and at that time, they were the best. I wonder when these guys are going to start playing hard, you know? Mm. So 
hey, Mel, we went out to eat one night, and Mel Carr told me, he goes, man, you're going to be really good in this league. And I said, really? And I said, yeah, but you guys ain't playing. He goes, oh, yeah, we're playing. He said, they're talking about it. They think you're going to be pretty good. We will see other, you know, uh, American, Caucasian, I suppose, uh, European-American. There's, there's, there's one guy in NBA history that averages okay. 24 points, 10 rebounds, and 6 assists for his career. And I can Larry Bird. Uh, superstars eventually will see more than one, Stephen A. Smith. I'm not so sure. Get to the pros. Larry has this incredible year. Two, bird, a runner. It's good. But there he is watching in a club while Magic Johnson wins a championship, and he's thinking, ah, all right, I'm behind two to nothing now. <laughs> I watched that game, and I couldn't believe it. I always wanted to play at that level. But what Bird couldn't possibly have known was that he had inspired Magic's performance when he was named Rookie of the Year earlier that same day. The PR person from the Lakers says, hey, Irvin, the Rookie of the Year voting has come out. And Magic says, okay, well, who won? He said, well, Larry Bird won. And Magic says, well, was it close? And he said, oh, no. He went out that day, yes, to try to win the NBA championship, but also to prove it to one Larry Bird. You know what? I should have been Rookie of the Year. Even though I won the championship, I still wanted to win the Rookie of the Year, too. He won that championship. I was pissed. I won him one. But even after he had won one the next year, his obsession only grew deeper. I'd get up in the mornings and see what he did, because their games came on late, then you look at the box score. I had to have him there for some reason. Like a crutch, somebody I can compare myself to. I hated what was being said, that Larry was better than me, and I'm just a guy who can control the game. My first four or five years, that bothered me a lot. I didn't tell nobody it bothered me, but it did. He was a star when, when he first arrived here, coming off the NC2A game. And quickly, during that first season, um, he became one of the stars in town. But that game put him on another level. But if anyone could dim Showtime's dazzle, it was Larry Bird and company. Three times in four years, the NBA's two leading lights met in the finals, and the heat generated by their rivalry was felt across the nation. Their competitive dislike emerged from a greater truth, that on the court, they were doppelgangers. Team-oriented stars who cared about winning above all else. Basketball savants who fused the substance of the 60s with the style of the 70s to create a new and exciting yet selfless way to play the game in the 1980s. Yeah, I'm gonna pass, but I'm gonna pass in a way to make you look like a jackass. They were so similar in the way they competed. I mean, they were two halves of the same brain. Same craziness to excel. I've seen that first couple of days I was with him. Basketball IQ off the chart. Seen the game a little different, most players. Playing the game the right way was everything. A lot of guys can just score, a lot of guys can just rebound. A lot of guys can just make plays. We can do it all. Larry and Magic could control the game with 12 shots. It was amazing. They'd be 7 for 12. They'd have 20 points, 15 rebounds, and 12 assists. And you go, man, the guy shot the ball 12 times and was the best player on the court by far. But I think it was tough at first. I don't think either one of them wanted to recognize that they had any equal anywhere in what they did. But they sure as hell didn't want to recognize that their equal happened to be that other guy. That's why we hated each other, too, because we knew we were mirrors of each other. I think for a while, the two of them had, they had to come to grips with that. They had begun changing the game. We were able to change not only basketball, but we were able to change the NBA too. When the NBA and CBS signed a new TV deal before the 82-83 season, the rescue plan was simple. Sell more bird and magic. And sell them not just as ball players, but as arch rival characters in their own dramatic saga. You got this slick, showtime, African-American guy out west, and you got the lunch bucket, floppy-haired white guy with the bruises all over his body. It's central casting. It's perfect. I mean, this was like made in heaven. In 1979, this idea of magic and bird was created, and so that was sort of a no-brainer. We'd have a doubleheader. It would be the Celtics playing first and the Lakers playing second, and that's the way we did it. And when the Celtics and Lakers both reached the finals just a year into the new TV deal in 1984, it appeared.
feared the superstar investment was about to pay off. It was huge. It was probably the biggest moment the NBA had up to that point. You had Boston and L.A., east against west. It had all the elements of, of a classic showdown. Including what was becoming the most inescapable element of all. Did we know that the blacks and whites were lining up, the whites with the Celtics, the blacks with... Of course we knew that. Even in the Celtics' own backyard. They land at Logan Airport at the 84 finals. He's getting accosted by various people who are telling him Larry's going to take him down. But this one older African-American gentleman comes up to me and goes, Magic, I want to wish you well, good luck, I want you to crush the Celtics. And he said, oh, well, where are you from? He said, well, I'm from Boston. And he said, you're from Boston and you're rooting for the Lakers? I thought everybody here was crazy about the Celtics. And he looked right at me and said, now why would I root for those white boys? Boston, after all, was a town still scarred by the ugly busing crisis of the mid-70s. A violent period of urban unrest during which white had been pitted against black. The resulting taint on the city nationally, coupled with a Boston roster littered with white players, affirmed to many black Americans that the Celtics were not the team for them. Even today, people said, you played with the Celtics. And, you know, I hated you at that time. You know, I, I wanted Magic to win. I didn't want that damn Larry Bird to win. We had all these black players, but they looked at us because we had Larry Bird leading us as a team that was white. The Lakers and the Celtics really didn't like each other. And it kept fans attracted to it. It kept fans enthralled. And the fact that, that every time they were asked to perform, Magic and Bird really did, only heightened it. It was the East Coast versus the West Coast. Celtic pride versus Laker tradition. It was Bird versus Magic. The most hellacious competitors going at each other. They'll kill each other out the court. Whatever it takes to win. Magic always needed that. We needed each other. We made each other get better and better. We made each other have to go practice in the summertime because I knew Larry Bird was shooting two, three hundred jumpers a day. So that made me have to do it. This is this guy's gonna be a nag or a thorn in my side for a long time. There was something that made Larry Bird and Magic Johnson kindred spirits in their respect for the game, their respect for the way it should be played. The Larry and Magic rivalry caught the attention of fans across the country. One of them was the urban black kid from Michigan, and the other one was the, you know, manure-kicking country boy from Indiana. I mean, that was perfect. That's central casting. Your person you measured yourself against was Larry Bird. What a pass, Magic Johnson. I probably wish all guys and all players had an opportunity to play in the championship and play against the, play with the Lakers or the Celtics during that time. Uh, then, they, then they understand what basketball really is. The uh, hard-nosed, tough, East Coast-type team that used the pass to kind of run their fast break, and we were the Showtime tuxedo win, <laughs> you know, just run up and down. We don't, you, know, we, you know, I mean, it was just two different styles. They were perfect archetypes for what was becoming the biggest story in sports. But for the real-life players, the narrative was much simpler. It's finally going to happen. We get to go head-to-head -head again. It's just a matter of rolling that ball out there and let's get it on. Welcome then to the Boston Garden and the start of the NBA World Championship Series. I'm Brent Musburger. In each of the last four NBA World Championship Series, either Magic or Bird has competed. But this is the first time that the two have gone head to head for the time. Man, we jumped out on them that first game. And we won in Boston. And with less than a minute to go in game two, the Lakers were closing in on a commanding series lead. From that point on, things began to crumble. Down to nine seconds. Magic holds the ball. Magic trying to work on Maxwell. Magic has still got us down to two seconds. One second. 
He's gonna have to shoot it. He doesn't get it off. He doesn't get it off. Cheesy Johnson dribbling the timeout. <laughs> what? What are you doing? The Lakers regained their stride in Game Three, only to be rudely knocked off it again in Game Four. And now let's watch it. Cooper and the Celtics, and now the bench is empty. When Kurt Rambis got taken out, we started fighting instead of playing. Kareem swings the elbow, and now is yelling at Larry Bird, jaw to jaw. And it made us realize we were not mentally tougher than the Celtics. Magic's just not himself. To be sure they won't let the time run out as they did in game two. Harris steals the ball and the Celtics call a timeout. There are a number of places where, you know, Irvin didn't do what people expected him to do. Tied at 123. He misses the first. Johnson misses them both. Celtics want a timeout. Responded. Magic Johnson goes to the bench. Burr turnaround hits. Game five went to the Celtics. Game six to the Lakers. It was like 1979 all over again. Down to one game for Bird and Magic. If everybody had to look at it, probably would have said this is going to be seven game series. Well, I thought we'd sweep them in four, but it's uh, went a little bit longer. Now we just have to do it in seven. That's the only time I ever felt that. There ain't no way they're walking out here with a win. Magic Johnson. No way. Lakers have several chances, and here's Larry Bird chucking down the court. myself in, in being the guy who's going to win it for us and and deliver under pressure and um, it didn't happen game seven of the 84 series was one of CBS's highest rated telecasts of the year and the highest rated game the NBA had ever produced all of a sudden whether it was at CBS or Madison Avenue the sports writers around the country became a phenomenon what is happening here the absolute foundation in this resurgence was the Celtics and the Lakers, Larry Bird and Magic Johnson. But Magic was in no mood to bask in the accomplishment. I took up a, a media beating. Tragic Magic. This is why we say Larry Bird is better. It's probably the first time ever in my life I was depressed. And I didn't want people to see me. It was something I never dealt with in my life. I hope he was hurt and hope it killed him. He made some bad plays down the stretch, and nobody in there was happier than me. You know, not only when the game makes you feel good, but just knowing the other guy's suffering, and you know he was. I remember after the game that both he and I uh, were in the showers crying and stayed in there for about 35, 40 minutes. It was hard because not only had we lost to the Boston Celtics, he had lost to his nemesis, Larry Bird. I think he just made me dislike him more you know, because he was that good. And, and I think you, you, you'd be jealous. You, you're jealous a little bit. Larry, does this get you even with magic for what happened between Michigan State and Indiana State all those many years ago? Yeah, we're professionals now, but uh, I want this one for Terry Holt. Well, it was a big deal. I remember asking Quinn Buckner about it afterwards. They had a celebration in downtown Boston after they won the championship. And, you know, it was unusual for Larry to have these little outbursts, as Quinn would call them. But, you know, about 11.30 at night, Finally, he turned to Quinn, he goes, I got him. I finally got him. And he was talking about magic. 
In 1984, the Celtics claimed first championship blood from the Lakers in the war between Magic and Bird. While the Boston Stars' 27-point average lifted his team to a seven-game victory, Johnson made ill-advised decisions in the closing minutes of the fourth quarter in overtime losses in games two and four. Every year, that was the talk. We're going to get Boston this year, and I think it became even more so in 84. Uh, we had them on the ropes, and it turned out to our dismay. And I always remember sitting in Boston Garden in the shower of magic, and we were like, man, we had that. But you know what? The fun thing about this rivalry and this game is that there's always next year. You crazy. <laughs> I said, you're crazy. I'm not shooting no commercial with Larry. So I said, okay, what, we're going to shoot it in L.A.? I would never went to L.A. to film it. Well, where are we going to shoot it? If you want to shoot a commercial, come to my house. I was like, oh, no. One stoplight. I thought Lansing was small. I think the plan was, I'm going to go here, I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do, and I'm trying to get up out of here. My plan was that. I heard Converse made a pair of bird shoes for last year's MVP. Yep. When they made a pair of magic shoes for this year's MVP. Okay, Magic, show me what you got. Even after Converse had convinced Magic and Bird to film a sneaker ad together in the summer of 85, a question remained. How would the two hated rivals on the court get along off of it? I don't know how he's going to react. I don't know how I'm going to react. We didn't even shake hands, so how are we going to do a commercial together? The ad was to be filmed at the home Bird had built for his mom. It featured a full-length basketball court, the day's first location. So they say, okay, you're playing one-on-one, -on -one, and I'm looking at Larry, and he's looking at me like, is this real? Are we playing, playing? Because, you know, this, this, is, this is magic and bird. I could just hear Larry, you know, starting in on, well, you bring it to the basket, and I'm going to send it 30 rows up. So the guy was like, no, no, not like that. A fun game, we were both like, oh, okay. Like, <laughs> like you can see this relief coming over both of our faces. That brief detente led to the next stage, dialogue. We sat down next to each other. How was your summer? Oh, it's going good. How was yours? It's going great. I said, man, it's a nice spread you got. He's asked me, is this where you play? I said, yeah, I play here if it's not windy. If it's raining or windy, I go to the gym. But this is where I do all my work. I see that tractor. You work on the, on the tractor? He said, man, I work on this tractor every day. Larry Bird work on a tractor? He said, yeah. It's just them two walking and talking, and every once in a while they'd stop, and one of them would say something, and then they'd start laughing. Then they said, okay, break. It's lunch break time. I was going to my trailer. He said, no, my mother has prepared lunch for us up at the house. We went up to the house, and we sat down there, and we talked, and my mom, my brothers, thought the world of him. His mother was so nice making sure I had enough to eat. I just saw my mother. It was crazy. He charmed her. You can see it. But that's magic. He makes everybody feel welcome and warm, and he's a con man. <laughs> and while magic charmed Georgia Bird, it was someone else who intrigued her son. He met Irvin at lunch. Irvin was a good dude. I like Irvin a lot better than Magic. I was just so happy to finally be Irvin with him because Magic was like, I don't know if I want to get to know this guy. But Irvin got a chance to talk about family, how he grew up. We just, we just became two relaxed guys just talking. That day was great. It was a great day, beautiful day. Still for Bird, ever the competitor, that's all it was, just one day. Magic thinks the next year, okay, well, now we're great friends. So, you know, after the game, we're going to go out, we're going to have a, a beer. And Larry's like, 
no, you're right. I know you better. You're a good guy, but I still don't want anything to do with you. He's a happy-go-lucky guy. If me and him got to be really good friends, go out on the court, he could still play the same game. I couldn't. I mean, that's just the way it is. Nope. One time great white hope, who would further emerge as the polarizing racial figure, due in part to that era's increasingly conservative political climate. The rolling back institutionally of the achievements of the civil rights movement were going on apace from about 1975 on. But the triumph of the movement that rolled it back took place in the 1980s. And I think there was people who were very aware in the black community of what was going on. And I think there was a lot of sublimated frustration. And I think one of the ways it got sublimated was into basketball. And I think Larry, through no fault of his own, was the receptacle within which the lingering resentments somehow floated. And after Bird led the Celtics to the championship in 1986, his third in the pros, winning his third straight MVP award in the process, the resentment grew. I always felt that the press was biased in favor of Larry Bird. It always felt to me like they were going to make Larry the hero. You know, you'd see somebody score, and Larry would be in a cast in a suit on the bench, and they'd say, Larry Bird made that possible a couple weeks ago when he told that guy he could do it, and he just did it. And they they going to get his motherfucker the assistant. He not in the game. Not to be racist, but we have a white guy who's the best in the world. Predominantly a black sport now, and you got a guy like Larry Bird who can't run, who can't jump, but can do everything out there. Bird may have sought to avoid the conversation entirely, but the more he won, the less he could escape it. Now there's a steal by Bird underneath the DJ. What a play by Bird! In 1987, after Boston beat the Detroit Pistons to advance to the finals for the fourth straight year, Pistons rookie Dennis Rodman called Bird overrated because he was white. His teammate Isaiah Thomas then chimed in with some thoughts of his own. I can remember uh, in the locker room, I think it was Jack McMullen came up to me and said, Isaiah just said, boom, 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 boom. And I go, so? He didn't care. He didn't care. Everybody else around him cared very deeply in the days and weeks as it turned out ahead. I mean, the media made it out like it was something. But it didn't matter to me what Isaiah or Dennis Rodman said, and it still don't. And in 1987, as Bird vied with magic to be the best, the flap over Isaiah Thomas's racially fueled remarks forced Bird to address his least favorite topic at the worst possible time. I had to go to a press conference when I was in LA trying to get ready to play the Lakers and tell people I didn't care, this don't bother me. The main thing is if the statements or whatever was said doesn't bother me. I don't think it should bother any of us. From playing all year, trying to get back to the finals and play against Magic, this was a distraction. Magic was on a mission to prove to himself and the world that with the ball in his hands, he was still the one in control. And after his Lakers ran through the 85 season, he quickly got what he wanted. Another shot at Bird and the Celtics. They won the East, we won the West. So it's like, uh, everybody just get ready, sit back, and uh, let's enjoy it. <laughs> but that smile belied the intensity of the clash that awaited. Bird was facing off against Magic for the third time in four years. And if their relationship had softened, the determination to beat each other had not. If I had a glass of water and any of those guys had been on fire, I would have drank the water and watched them. They called us, you know, chokers and sissies. You know, we didn't like that, and they thought less of us. I knew they did. In 85, we played them four times in exhibition season for some reason. I don't know why they scheduled that. By the fourth game, there was an all-out brawl. They call this one of the greatest rivalries in all of sport, the Celtics and the Lakers. And if that is true, 
It is the most one-sided rivalry in all of sports. Eight times these two have met for the NBA championship, and eight times the Celtics have won. At guard in his sixth year for Michigan State, the number 32, Magic Johnson. But in the 85 finals, Magic changed the script. Over six grueling games, he masterfully controlled the pace with all-around brilliance. He has a triple-double again. Behind their point guard, the Lakers finally knocked out the Celtics, winning the clinching game in the Boston Garden. Three in six years, L.A. comes to Boston and wins the world title. Redemption for one Magic Johnson. It's a long year last year to wait for this moment right now. Magic had evened the score with Bird on the NBA floor, but the significance of their rivalry and their relationship was still just taking hold. As game four proved, the level of competition between them was higher than ever. Bird played awesome down the stretch of that game. Trailing 2-1 in the series, the Celtics were down by one point in the final minute of the game. But Larry Bird wouldn't be easily vanquished. Open his aim. With seven seconds left, though, the Lakers still had life. Three years earlier in the 84 finals, Magic had flubbed a similar situation. But this was a different Magic, one with a whole new bag of tricks. My man switched to Kareem, and Kevin McHale jumped out to me. And as soon as I saw Kevin, I said, oh, I'm taking him. You know, Magic puts it on the floor, a couple head and shoulder fakes. He raised up in the air, and there was nobody that was going to get that shot. Magic with a hook shot, scores with two. I remember after they called timeout thinking, there's still a shot here. Celtics may still win this game. Well, they set up a great play. Bird walked Worthy all the way up, forced the denial all the way up. We've done it before. Clear everybody out, go to the ball, break the corner. He caught it here, and as he caught it, all he had to do was turn. And he just turned, and he just let this thing go. Bird fires it. Got a wide open look, couldn't believe it. And I'm standing right there, it is straight as an arrow. Dead on. And the Lakers have won. They were lucky, because it was right on line. He looked at me like, how did you ever leave me that wide open? <laughs> you gotta be kidding me. Change the whole series. The Lakers won the series in six. And in the aftermath of a year in which Magic had won his first MVP, the rivalry suddenly took on a new tone. Magic's just a great basketball player. He's the best I've ever seen, you know. I... Unbelievable. I don't know what to say. I was shocked that he said it, because I thought to myself, maybe this is the beginning of a new era that's not going to include him. It was the passing of the torch a little bit. After being going against each other for so many years, how does it feel to you? <laughs> well, there's a lot of pressure off of him, because at least I know I got somebody here that really knows how to play the game. Uh, in Boston, I got some great guards, but... Uh, Magic's one of the best. It's going to be an honor to play with him. It's a new look, Larry Bird. You've lost your mustache. You've got a lot of sun. You've been enjoying yourself out on the West Coast. Yeah, yeah I've been enjoying myself, but uh, I'll be back the same old way I've been when I get back to Boston, so uh, I don't think there's any room for concern. Listen, Magic, even though you two are on the same team, there must be a little friendly rivalry going on here to see who can come up with what, the fanciest pass? Well, not, not this evening. I think that we're going to go out to win and have a good time. I think we're going to enjoy the moment. We're not going to try to outdo each other. We're going to just try to make it good for the fans and try to win the game. Have fun. That's the important thing. That's it. That's it. Give them a show. Ma Magic, Larry, thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, it should be an exciting and outstanding basketball game. Chick, now back to you. Ladies and gentlemen, 
playing Larry Bird, Mr. Tom Coker! And in the role of Magic Johnson, please welcome Mr. Kevin Daniels! It's an incredible night. I, uh, Tamara Tooney, a uh, good friend of mine, asked me to become an investor on this show, and I read it, and after she said Larry Bird and Magic Johnson, I said, well, you had me at Larry Bird. I am thrilled. I mean, I, our office is right down the street. I grew up in New York. I live up on the west side. Madison Square Garden is south of here, so at the epicenter of New York City on Broadway, the NBA is on the marquee, so it's a great night for me. It's a little different than I'm used to, but uh, being with Irving, uh, we don't get together a lot. Uh, I think last time I seen it was probably six, seven weeks ago, but we like to hang out a little bit and, and to watch this night will be exciting for us. How surprising do you think it is to see an NBA show debut on the Great White Way? Why not? Want to do another revival? <laughs> Sick of it. I saw them the first time around. Why do you think audiences should come out and see uh, your, your life story? Well, if you're a sports fan and you've been around long enough, I think that they know our, our story. And I think it's a great opportunity for the ladies to bring their husbands down and take a look. One of my pet peeves always is when people say, oh, Michael Jordan saved the NBA. Bullshit. Bullshit. Magic and Larry saved the NBA. That's who saved the NBA. Magic and Larry. Nothing but net. I love you, I respect you, and I admire you.